Hi, welcome to the IB trial lesson on complex numbers. My name is Prudence and let's go right to it. Before we dive straight into the trial lesson on complex numbers, it's good to go over what an IB classroom looks like. In an IB classroom, teacher assists students to develop IB learner profile, which consists of 10 attributes. For example, teachers help students to be inquirers, to be knowledgeable, to be thinkers, to be communicators, to be open-minded, just to name a few. Teachers also assist students to apply approaches to learning, which are ATL skills. And they include research skills, communication skills, thinking skills, social skills, and self-management skills. In an IB classroom, students and teachers discuss a theory of knowledge, TOK. And these discussions reflect on the nature of knowledge and on how we know what we claim we know. And finally, an IB classroom fosters international mindedness. In this case, um, it fosters students to see themselves connected to the global community and raise awareness of the interrelatedness of all nations. So for example, history, um, knowing different mathematicians around the world, all these things will foster international mindedness. And so today's topic, uh, we're going to be talking about complex numbers. Typically, this is a higher level topic in the mathematics classroom. Complex numbers, as you see here, is represented by this variable C with a double line. Unlike a regular variable, complex numbers, in this case with a double line, represent a set of numbers. And these set of numbers actually exist in our world for many, many, many years. However, we actually don't know and don't touch it for many years of our schooling. So let's look at something that we know. This function here, it's a parabola. f of x is equals to x squared minus four. And here with an exponent two, we know that it has a degree of two. So what are the roots of this function? Visually, we can identify the roots of this function by looking at the intersections of the function and the x-axis. And so here it is. The intersections locate, are located at x equals to negative 2 and x equals to 2. And therefore, the roots of this function is x equals to plus and minus 2. Another of this function, f of x equals to x squared plus 1. Again, what are the roots of this function? Visually, we cannot tell because there are no intersections um, between the function and the x-axis. So we say there are no real roots. However, an element of international mindedness, Descartes, a French mathematician in the 17th century, he said that all geometric problems could be solved algebraically and vice versa. So let's take a look at our problem again. Here, we already found this answer um, visually. To solve this algebraically, we set this equation and make it equal to zero, x squared minus four equals to 10, uh, zero. And we move the four over, and in order to solve for x, we square root both sides. So x is equal to plus and minus two answers of square root of four. And we simplify this to x equals to plus and minus two, which in this case, our answers align with our visual answer, x equals to plus and minus two. For this function, f of x equals to x squared plus one, again, let's solve this algebraically. We set this equal to zero, um, we put the one over, make it into negative one, and to solve for x, we square root both sides, giving two answers. x is equals to plus and minus square root of negative one. But wait a minute, it is not possible. If you put this in the calculator, the calculator would just say no real numbers. You can't simply square root a negative one, because after all, how can two identical numbers, when multiplied, the product is negative? Well, another element of international mindedness, Gauss is a German mathematician in the 18th century, proved that the degree of a polynomial equation is equal to the number of its roots. So if that is the case, we have this function here with a degree of two, which implies that this function here should have two roots. But how? We couldn't find the answer, x cannot be square root of a negative one, we don't see it visually, nor, and also we cannot solve it algebraically. So how can we advance? Before we do that, let's look at this TOK problem. 
How accurate is a visual representation of a mathematical concept? In a typical IB classroom, um, students will be given this TOK question. Um, they, get, they get to look through their devices to do some research or um, do their research at home. Then they come back to the classrooms and talk about um, this topic with their insights so that they're not just understanding the content but also question on what they know. So let's get back to Gauss. He said that it is possible. So now let's look at back at history of numbers. In order for us to advance in mathematics, we need to look at the history, the development of numbers. And so right here, we know that back in the ancient Egypt, um, zeros and negatives were never a thing. It was very hard to accept. Counting numbers widely used by Babylonians, Chinese, and Aztecs it's very easy. You can use your fingers. You can use um, things to count. These are called counting numbers, or today we call it natural numbers. Fractions widely used by Egyptians um, in 1800 BC, they have a full set of um, fractions as well. However, zero and negative numbers are very difficult to comprehend. After all, why would they need a number for nothing? So the Babylonians as well, um, they don't accept the zeros, um, and nor a negative uh, numbers as well. Same things for the Omex. They do use zero as a placeholder to differentiate between numbers 31 and 301, for example. And obviously, as well as the Greeks, they actually didn't recognize zeros as a number, um, as a placeholder, as well as negative numbers. Now, on the other side of the globe, China, between 200 BC to 200 AD, Chinese actually used a lot of negative numbers because they're great for recording debts. However, zero is still a very hard thing to accept. And finally, in India and Persia, actually between 600 AD to 1100 AD, uh, BC, sorry, 600 BC, all the way to 1100 AD, actually, they, there are lots of brilliant mathematicians there and they accepted and believed that um, existence of zero, negative numbers, and zero as a placeholder. And finally, a uh, number of years afterwards, the Renaissance Europe um, widely accepted these three um, concepts as well and understanding as well. So now, why is it so hard to understand negatives and zeros? For us, it's very simple. But back then, it's very hard to grasp because Let's say you want to find an unknown, x plus 4 equals to 3. To find that unknown, you need to subtract 4 on both sides to retain the equilibrium. And you get the unknown to be equal to 3 minus 4. If you're going to represent this on a number line from 0 onwards, because they didn't believe that um, negative numbers exist, you start from 3 and then you subtract 4. Wait a second, it just doesn't exist. There is no number after 0. So when you're a child, you have three apples and perhaps your dad asked you, I'm going to take away four of your apples. It doesn't make any sense to you when you're a little. Same thing for these people back in the day. And so with that understanding, square root of negative one is also a very hard concept for mathematicians to understand and to be widely accepted in the math community. And so over 200 years, this still stays as somewhat of an imaginary or even impossible square of negative one. But within these 200 years, mathematicians came to understand that um, square root of negative one actually exists, um, but it just doesn't really belong in the number line. Um, it's just a, some, a number of its own. It doesn't really exist in real life on the number line on the number system. Um, similar to uh, rational numbers, fractions, natural numbers. But they do know because a lot of the calculations, calculations that they had actually um, appeared a square root of negative one multiple times. And up until Euler, um, close to the 1900, he finally represented square root of negative one using the symbol i because it was just too much to write every single time. And so with this revelation and a new understanding that the symbol I represent square root of negative one, kind of like an imaginary, I stands for imaginary number, then we go back to this problem that we couldn't solve. 
x we found to be equal to plus and minus square root of negative 1. And now, once we replace square root of negative 1 as i, then we get the answer x is plus and minus i. With this understanding and with this new insight, we can actually apply the concept of i, the imaginary number, to other number, imaginary numbers as well. For example, square root of negative 4. It can be written as square root of 4 times square root of negative i. Well, sorry, negative 1, which equals to 2 times i, and we simplify it to be 2i. So therefore, square root of negative 4 is 2i, which leads us to this new understanding called the complex numbers. Real numbers, which we all know already from counting numbers, from integers, decimals, irrational numbers, rational numbers, these are all um, numbers that exist on the number line called the real numbers. And then there are the discovery of the imaginary numbers that's represented by i. Together, we now call this complex numbers. And complex numbers can be written into this form, 3 plus 2i, where it consists of a real part, meaning it's a real number, 3 in this case, and 2i, which is an imaginary part. 3 is a real number, and it can be replaced as any real number, a fraction, a decimal, a negative number, and so on. And the imaginary part um, is represented by um, the symbol i connected with a coefficient, in this case, 2. So how are we going to put this um, complex number on the grid? Well, the number line is not going to be sufficient. It's like one dimensional, like a regular Cartesian plane for x and y plane. The y plane here, however, it's an imaginary plane. It really doesn't exist. So when we plot this complex number, we just look at it as if it is a 2D, so to speak, plane. We move 2 to the left side, and then we move 2 up. And this dot right here represents the complex number negative 2 plus 2i. But if you think about it, it actually it's off the grid because the number line, it exists. This imaginary axis doesn't really exist. So this orange dot is actually off the chart. A little bit crazy, but it works. And once we know about complex numbers, we can actually do a lot of similar things as we normally do with real numbers. We can add and we can subtract. Just note that for complex numbers, there's always a real part and an imaginary part. So when we add, we combine the real parts together. 3 plus 4 is 7. And then we combine the imaginary part, 2i plus 5i equals 7i. So the sum of these two complex numbers is 7 plus 7i. Subtraction follows a similar manner. We combine the real numbers together, which is 3 minus 4 gives you negative 1. And then we combine the imaginary part, 2i minus 5i becomes negative 3i. So the difference of these two complex numbers is negative 1 minus 3i. Likewise, uh, we know that on a number line, we can find the absolute value of any number. Absolute value, in other words, means the distance from 0. So the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. Likewise, when we're looking at the absolute value of a complex number, we're actually looking at the distance from the origin. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to treat this like a triangle, a right angle triangle. We have the vertical length of 2i and then the horizontal length of 5. And by using the property or the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we can then say that, well, c squared is the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle, which is the distance um, for the problem that we're trying to solve. And when we replace a and b respectively, in this case, a is 2. We don't put the i there because it's just um, the 2. And b is the length of 5. Then we find that um, the hypotenuse is square root of 29. So therefore, the absolute value of complex number 5 plus 2i is square root of 29. So now, going back to this question, at first, we didn't know how to solve this. We're stuck at the fact that x is equal to plus and minus square root of negative 1. Then we have this breakthrough that x is now 
plus and minus i, the symbol for square root of negative 1, an imaginary number. Well, right here, in the 2D plane on the left, you see that there are no intersections. But now that we have um, incorporated and understand there's another axis called the imaginary axis, then we can see that problems actually become more creative. And there can be, and there actually exist, um, roots in this case, but it's just on a different plane. Not that we can see from with our naked eyes, but it's there. And that really shows that the, the brilliance um, of complex numbers, because without them, we actually miss out a lot of mathematics. And so now let's go back to this question, the theory of knowledge. How accurate is a visual representation of a mathematical concept? Hope that you have a better understanding of how to answer this question. There's no such right or wrong, wrong answer, so to speak. When you um, answer this question, maybe in the beginning of this lesson, compared to now, perhaps you have different uh, insight, different viewpoints, and different perspectives um, for this question. But the idea of TOK is for us to reflect on the nature of knowledge and also question what we know so that we can have a better understanding of ourselves, of the world, in a theoretical manner. So in this short um, IB trial lesson, we went through complex numbers. Were you able to identify the IB learner profile? For example, understanding what complex numbers are, be knowledgeable, to think about things, to communicate um, with others if there's cl um, class discussions and at home doing research and bring back what you know to communicate with other people through um, the English language and through um, calculations. Be open-minded and be risk takers. A lot of times um, you're asked to share your response, share your insights, and to be open-minded and to take risks um, is part of the IB learner profile. Approaches to learning the ATL skills. Research. In order to answer those questions, you have to do a little bit of a research. Communication, again, thinking. Think about what you know. Social, interactive with your peers and teachers, and self-management skills. In a regular classroom, there are tests, there are projects, there are um, final exams need to prepare for. All of these required um, lots of self-management skills. Theory of knowledge. There are many theory of knowledge questions in every single IB subject. And for today, we focused on this question. How accurate is a visual representation of a mathematical concept? And finally, international mindedness. And for us today, we talked about the development of numbers around the world. We looked at different parts of the world and famous mathematicians um, that contributed to the development of numbers. And that way, we're able to better understand um, Discovery is not really linear, it goes back and forth. If something is not widely accepted, they get pushed aside until there's um, great breakthrough. Moreover, different parts of the world also independently invented, um, discovered mathematics as well. And so by understanding um, the international mindedness to raise awareness for that, we are better equipped to be more sensible, to be more aware, um, to be more accepting to people that are different than us. So hopefully that you're able to get a taste of what's like in an IB classroom.